Hi everybody, Carrie here and welcome to Vintage Soup. Now this is a different sort of video for me. I am sort of attempting a vlog of sorts. Um, this is basically a casual review of a couple of films that I had the opportunity to watch at the Hippodrome Silent Film Festival. And I just wanted to casually chat about them in my rather amateur way. So the Hippodrome Silent Film Festival, nicknamed Hipfest, is an annual silent film festival held in the small Falkirk town of Bow Ness, Scotland. The majority of the festival is held at the Hippodrome Cinema, which is in the centre of town and it's the oldest purpose-built cinema in Scotland. Built in, I think, 1912, the Hippodrome has been gorgeously restored inside with a magical vintage aesthetic. It's the only silent film festival in Scotland and it has helped nurture my interest in silent cinema over the past few years. Because of the pandemic in 2021 the festival's whole program was online um, which meant I had the opportunity to see everything each film each lecture and even a bit of local history and it was pretty amazing I was introduced to the works of the early African-American director Oscar Michaud also a Mary Pickford film it's someone who I stupidly avoided previously um, there was also the visually stunning documentary Grass, a nation's battle for life, and an early Marlene Dietrich silent. Hopefully I get the opportunity to revisit some of these films at a later date on the channel. Um, so this year, as we hopefully return to some form of normality, I vowed that I would attend as much of the festival as I possibly could forgetting that my normality is travelling a considerable distance with my kids in tow. Unlike most film festivals, there are a couple of suitable events for children. We attended what is called the Julie Jar screening. And this is based on an old practice from way back in the 1920s where children could swap a jam jar for a cinema ticket. We saw two classic shorts, Chaplin's Behind the Screen, from 1916, as well as Buster Keaton's Sherlock Jr. Now, while I've watched all of Chaplin's features, there are still many, many shorts that I haven't seen, and this was my first viewing of Behind the Screen. As I watched, I realised there were a few familiar scenes, specifically um, the part where Chaplin kisses Edna Provence while she is dressed as a boy and Eric Campbell walks in on them. Um, I believe I first saw this in the uh, famous 1990s cinema documentary Celluloid Closet. The, the short lasts about 25 minutes and takes a comical look at film production. Chaplin is a variation of his tramp persona, though surprisingly he's christened his character David. Chaplin was only a couple of years into his screen career at this point, but he was significantly developing as an artist. By this time, he had moved to Mutual Film Corporation, the third after working with Matt Sennett and s &E. While the previous studios had turned Chaplin into a star, Mutual would provide the comedian with complete creative control. Behind the Screen is believed to be not merely a comedy about filmmaking, but a direct mocking critique of Senate's studio. And it's interesting to see that even in 1916, the pie gag was considered too broad and crude. A while thought to be a silent comedy trope, custard pie fights weren't actually that common. And the film's climax is meant to poke fun at the madcap keystone endings. It's well paced and it does bring the film to a satisfactory conclusion. And this is a fun Chaplin short that makes the most of its 20 minutes. 
Edna Purviance is a charming female lead who throws herself into the fun. Chaplin's ultimate adversary, Eric Campbell as Goliath, is a fun bully that always gets his comeuppance. It's a pity that his film career only lasted three short years. The Tramp himself is as likeable and quick-witted as ever. The pacing is terrific and it doesn't let up. From Chaplin trying to eat lunch to accidentally jamming most of the film crew in a trapdoor, each incident escalates. The film is not as sentimental as some of Chaplin's later work. It's a short, simple comedy that just gets right to the point and is a great deal of fun. The second film we watched was the Buster Keaton classic Sherlock Jr. from 1924. We were familiar with this film and I think it's an ideal introduction to the work of the stone-faced acrobatic genius of Buster Keaton. Like the Chaplin short, we see the relatively new influence of cinema within the film. A young cinema projectionist, played by Keaton, yearns to be a detective whilst courting a local girl. However, a local rogue also has his eye on the girl and frames Buster for stealing a watch. So far, the plot is sweet, with many funny moments, but it's somewhat pedestrian. When Buster returns to the cinema and falls asleep on the job as a projectionist, we are treated to an intriguing dream sequence and it is here that we can truly appreciate the full extent of his genius. Buster's dream self runs to the screen and jumps into the action. In what is probably the most celebrated sequence, the cinematic scenery changes around Buster in a series of jump cuts. Buster is thrown from one scenario to another, he goes to walk down the stairs and waffles off a garden plinth, then he sits on the bench only for it to cut to a street, etc. And each cut becomes more elaborate and dangerous. Um, it's still an awe-inspiring and timeless piece of filmmaking that is always impressive, but even more so on the big screen. The film is jam-packed with impressive scenarios such as Buster's dream persona, Sherlock Jr. playing a perfect game of pool, much to the chagrin of the villains who are unsuccessfully attempting to assassinate him. There are also a series of jaw-dropping stunts performed by Keaton. One sequence involves uh, Buster running along a train before grabbing onto a water spout and drenching him with water. In reality, this stunt caused him to lose consciousness and resulted in a severe neck injury. A decade later, Keaton would be informed that he had in fact broken his neck as a result of this stunt. Another dangerous stunt has Buster sitting on the handlebars of a driverless motorbike. It's still an exhilarating uh, sequence to watch today. Unfortunately, filming it also resulted in a crash. My children seem to enjoy the slapstick silliness of Chaplin more, and I think Keaton's sophistication might have gone over their heads. But I have to say, Buster Keaton's film is truly a timeless masterpiece. Both films are readily available to watch at home, but to see them on the big screen, especially with Neil Brand's excellent musical accompaniment, was an absolute joy. In the afternoon, I watched the British 1924 comedy Not For Sale, directed by W.P. Kalino and written by Lydia Hayward. I have to admit, before Hip Fest, I had never heard of Hayward. Unfortunately forgotten in later decades, Hayward had been one of the most respected screenwriters within the British film industry and was once described as the finest scenario writer we have by the Bioscope magazine. Not For Sale is a class comedy that is reminiscent of P.G. Woodhouse. When his earl father financially cuts off the entitled workshy Lord Martin Dering, his fiancée breaks up with him and he is obliged to find a job and take up lodgings at a modest boarding house. 
While he is forced to abide with a group of eccentric, demanding misfits, he bonds with Annie, the young owner of the guest house, and her young mischievous brother. Finding work as a chauffeur, he quickly realises the vapidness of his former life and discovers genuine happiness. The film is a character-led comedy and featured Ian Hunter in his film debut. Both Hunter and French actress Mary Odette share delightful chemistry. However, it's the ensemble supporting characters that truly shine. The boarding house is a blending of classes. There are a couple of bickering, self-righteous spinsters with delusions of grandeur. A scatty, emotional maid recruited from an orphanage that is determined to reform a local petty criminal by bringing him into the house as a butler. The most memorable character is John, the 12-year-old brother of Annie, who enjoys tormenting the lodgers with his cheek. I especially enjoy British films from this period that feature normal people going about their everyday business. There's a delightful scene where we see Martin, Annie and John jump on a bus and take a trip to the fair. And we also have an intriguing setting when Martin has to take up the bygone occupation of hop picking to make ends meet. The film has a gentle charm, if a little predictable. Special mention must be given to the musical accompaniment by Stephen Horn, which not only complemented the movie, but was especially impressive as at specific points Horn was simultaneously playing the piano with percussion or the flute. As a family, we then attended the Platform Reel show. Now this is a unique experience where an audience can watch train-related silence on the platform of the local steam train station. The films themselves were enjoyable, simple adventure shorts. The first was Station Content, starring a very young Gloria Swanson about a bored station master's wife that seeks excitement in show business before quickly realising the error of her ways. An unintentionally funny moment is when Swanson complains to her husband that their life is too quiet and he thinks he can remedy her boredom by teaching her Morse code. An interesting fact that was shared with us was that the baby in the film was an actress called Faye McKenzie, who was only 10 weeks old when she appeared in the movie. She would later continue to have a career in cinema, including a brief appearance in Breakfast at Tiffany's. But made she made her final appearance in a film called Killed, A Better Mouse Trap. This means that she is, so far, the only Hollywood performer to have a hundred year long career. The actress died in 2019. The second film was The Timber Queen, part of a serial starring Ruth Rowland. This is an absolute silent adventure melodrama. If someone is mocking silent cinema, this is the kind of thing they might point to. A young heroine is due to inherit a forest but is in danger of being murdered by her dastardly cousin. Roland's character is nearly off by a runaway train and despite impressive stunt work, needs her love interest to rescue her. The third film was The Lone Dale Operator, directed by D.W. Griffith, starring a 14-year-old Blanche Sweet and written by Matt Sennett. After her father takes ill, a young girl takes over a telegraph office but needs to fend off potential robbers. The film is considered revolutionary because it cut between three different locations and the 60-minute short consisted of over 100 shots. It was a satisfying conclusion to a cheesy trio that were fun to watch. The unfortunate problem with going to platform reels was that it clashed with the Hippodrome showing of F.W. Murnau's City Girl with live music by Neil Brand and the Dodge Brothers. My husband did get me a copy of the film, so we watched it later that night at home. So this review is a bit of a cheat, I'm afraid. I'm genuinely saddened that I didn't get the opportunity to see this on the big screen because it is truly a visually stunning film. Murnau had a mystic, artistic eye when capturing landscapes. The German artist Caspar David Friedrich, 
heavily influenced him, and we see this throughout his filmography. In City Girl, there is a breathtaking sequence when the young couple run through a wheat field. Fifty years later, the scene would influence Terence Malick's equally mesmerising Days of Heaven. City Girl is a late silent film produced in 1930 as talkies were becoming established. It's a companion piece to Murnau's masterpiece Sunrise, A Story of Two Humans, though has been overshadowed by it, which is a shame because City Girl is probably more relatable to my 21st century sensibilities. Like Sunrise, the film explores the disconnect between the city and the country. The story is of a country boy, Lem, travelling to Chicago and meeting a waitress, Kate, who is disenchanted with the busy yet isolating city. The pair fall in love, quickly marry and return to Lem's family in the country. Kate's romantic notions of country life are immediately shattered when she meets her hostile father-in-law and threatening farmhands. We can see Murnau's expressionistic roots in the later scenes with some beautiful chiaroscuro lighting which exudes menace. I really love the film and I'm kicking myself that I didn't get a chance to watch it at the festival. So this review is a bit of a cheat, though I swear I viewed it on the same night. I already have the 2023 Hippodrome Silent Film Festival marked in my diary and I hope to visit minus the children and get the opportunity to stay a bit longer. The few hours we had in Bowness was fantastic and we were blessed with some great weather, which helped. If you're interested in silent film, I can't recommend Hipfest enough, especially as our lives return to some form of normality. And such events are a rarity outside London. Cinema is always a communal experience. I had been in a theatre for over two years and sitting amongst people that were genuinely passionate about what they were watching and loving the live music was a moving experience. I will always be grateful for that one day in Bowness and I hope to repeat it.